Okay, let's see. I don't think we can. Okay, never mind. We're live, we're live, okay. Okay, I think the sound, the sound should be good. Change out the batteries. Uh, the plan was today, the plan today was to read this book by Angela Y. Davis, Women Racing Class. And we started, we started a little bit, just got about a little over 15 pages in. But... I do think again that it's a gloomy day and that kind of reflects on the the mood here today. For those of you who may not know, there was a there was an individual that was shot and killed by the Winnebago County Sheriff's Department uh yesterday. And still we don't have no type of um fact uh facts or um any type of other information on the incident but this is a a problem that has been uh rampant throughout the and throughout all police departments in Winnebago County and throughout Illinois and throughout throughout the world really throughout the world about the uh United States and throughout the world. So, uh, first, just uh, extend extend some love and some compassion, and some to the to the family that is affected and by this. But also, let's. I think we need to talk about how it's going to be handled. And I don't have any faith that Jay Hanley will handle this differently. Question: What ch uh, what changes would you like to see in law enforcement? I think number one is just stop killing people. I think when you say changes, you uh, typically are more inclined to reform. But as we've been reading and as we've been discussing and talking about things that when you send an armed officer to a situation, that armed officer is escalating that situation just by being there. Just by being there and uh, threatening somebody with arrest and threatening somebody with force, threatening somebody with, uh, shooting, with a shooting or a taser. That uh, When an armed officer shows up to an event, shows up anywhere, there's that threat of do as, you, do as we say or else. And we can't live in that, we can't freely live in that, a society where that is the norm. We can't freely live in a society where that is the, sta that is the standard. Where we can't freely live in a society where people are being gunned down. No one can freely live in a society where people are being gunned down. And again, we don't have, I uh, can't really get into specifics of the case because, of the incident rather, of the of the murder rather because there there isn't any information available but I don't believe that I don't have any faith that Jay Hanley will handle this any differently than uh Marilyn Height Ross did than uh Paul Logley did or Bruscato did. I don't have any faith that he will handle this any differently than uh his predecessors have. And again a lot of times as we've been, since we are in a uh, more state of awareness and we are more state, and we, through these past 10, 11 months, we have been able to acquire more knowledge and uh, gain more things about how the process works and how uh, things go down. I think the first step to be aware of is that the police lie. That, that, that standard that's almost in their policy is 
the first news story that's going to be put out is going to be completely different from what comes up in the court records, in the court trials, in the court proceedings, rather. So the police lie. We've seen it with uh, all these cases that are on the name on all these faces, all these faces that are a name on the poll, that are a picture on the poll, all these faces. The police came out. All these situations, uh, the police have lied. Police have uh, fabricated a story, fabricated their version of events. And because the individual has passed away, that person doesn't get the right to stand trial. That person has lost the right to stand trial. That person has, is going to be deemed guilty because he's been murdered. That person is going to be deemed guilty because the cop killed him. And they get to tell their side of the events. And so, we are we are going to read this book. We are going to read this um, book. I do think it's an important book. But we can't uh, we 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 can't ignore what's happening right here in Rockford. We can't ignore what's happening in these streets. We can't ignore how police are going into people's homes and killing people and murdering people. There was an incident, and I'm not gonna. I believe it was Vernon Sims. It was Vernon Sims. It was it was uh, it was a domestic call, and let me take this off. It was a domestic call, and there was uh, he he had a Vernon Sims. He responded to the scene, and it was an apartment, I believe. It was an apartment, and the report was a domestic, and he believe uh, someone was pepper sprayed. So he goes down. So he goes down. Goes to the Vernon Sims. He gets to the apartment. He climbs the stairs, and he passes the the individual, the young man that was pepper sprayed. And Vernon asked him if he was a man and if he had been pepper sprayed. The man said no and continued leaving. He continued leaving. The situ- the situation had already been de- de- escalated. The situation had already been handled. Uh, the young man was he was leaving the situation he was uh i think this is the case where it has this is the most proof that an officer did not need to be there this this is a separate situation that happened in the nineties that happened in the nineties i i want to clarify that i just want to make sure that i'm not um misspeaking or, uh so uh, the man says no. The man says no and continues to leave from the building. And Vernon follows him. Follows him, gets aggressive with him, and ends up shooting him. Just uh, the threat of an armed officer being at a situation that's an act of violence. It's a, it's a fear tactic. It's, a t- it's an intimidation tactic. Now, we've been outside City Hall for... Today is April 11th. I believe that's 191 days. 192 days ago, uh, a young man was shot in the back on South Main and Harrison by the Rockford Police Department. And that case was uh, just like all the other ones that were before it. All the other 49 that were before it. There was no uh, transparency. There was no accountability justified, just like all all the ones before it. Now we're here, almost uh, seven months later, six six months and some change later, and there's been another shooting. This one, uh, the individual has passed away. The individual has died. Oh, again, just our love to the family. And we're going to hear some things that where the police lie, but we're also going to hear th- some things from the city. We're going to hear some things from uh, Tom McNamara. We're going to hear some things from... And that, I believe, it, his complaint, or not his complaint, but his excuse whenever he's talked about how... 
uh, the 12-year-old girl got pepper sprayed at City Market or situations like that, he would always deflect and say, oh, that's Winnebago County, that's not Rockford. That's Winnebago County Sheriff's. That's, those aren't Rockford Police Department. That has been that's been his escape that's been his uh, escape route and his escape plan from answering questions and being accountable to the situation. So I wouldn't be surprised if on Monday Tom comes into work and he says, "Oh, that's Winnebago County. That's not Rockford." Our original demand when it came out here was for Tom to hold a press conference about the shooting of Cyrus Jones and about the uh, previous cases and previous incidents of police terrorism here in Rockford. And he, d he, d he did not do that. He did not reach that uh, demand that he did not make any attempt to reach that demand. He did not make any attempt to uh, reach out to the family of, of the individual or reach out to the public and uh, answer any questions or anything like that. So we have another shooting here in Rockford. And I'm sure that this will be just another day for him. I don't expect him to have uh, to come out on Monday and hold a press conference and I don't believe he'll do anything like that. We have read in, I forget which book it was, uh, they were blending in before, and now it's been a complete blend in. It's been a, a, sl a swirl of emotions and thoughts. But I talked about how silence in the face of evil is evil itself. But Tom not speaking, or Tom not holding a press conference, or Tom deflecting and uh, doing everything and anything he can to get away from answering these questions. That's, that's violence. That's evil itself. These shootings and these cases, they are happening here in Rockford, and Tom does not have a single thing to say about them. Fifty incidences since 1990, and they have all been ruled justified. All of them. And already, there is some stories getting out and uh, allegations are being made. But again, this person was murdered before they got the right to stay in trial. This person was murdered, and is going to be presumed guilty because they got murdered. They will not get the right to be in court. They will not get their day in court. They will just automatically be presumed guilty because of the narrative that's going to be put out there by the Winnebago, Winnebago County Sheriff's Department and by the city of Rockford and the Winnebago County government. We're gonna we're gonna get to reading. We're gonna get to reading. Um, yeah, we're gonna get to reading. I do think, again, um, just uh, before we read that. We read in a couple books that there needs to be a culture change before there's any type of policy change, before there's any type of anything like that. That We need to have a culture change. We need to change our hearts and minds. We need to change how we view these cases of police terrorists. We need to change how we view these incidences of police shootings. And we need to change how we uh, approach them. So I think number one is we need to approach this and attack this and view this with empathy. With empathy. This isn't a case. Again, I don't really, there isn't any uh, factual information that's been released yet. But it is a situation where we don't. 
We don't know who it could be next. We don't know who it could be next. Suzette Babbler was a 53-year-old white woman. Mikey Sago was 16 years old. There was another incident where they had shot and killed a 76-year-old man. We need to empathize with him with the family of this individual that was murdered and we need to not we need to but we need to change the culture here we cannot allow people to keep coming into the city and gunning people down in their own homes we're gonna get back to reading we're gonna start on page 15 again Okay. Yes, we're going to start right here. Okay. We're going to continue reading. We're going to continue this going. Um, We're reading Woman Race in Class by Angela Y. Davis. Disassociating himself from the questionable ethnometric collusion Conclusions reached by Fogel and Eggerman, who claimed that slavery left most families intact, Gutman confirms that countless slave families were forcibly disrupted. The separation, through and discriminate, th- I'm sorry, the separation, through and discriminate sales of husbands, wives, and children, was the terrifying hallmark of the North American variety of slavery. But as he points out, the bonds of love and affection, the cultural norms governing family relations, and the overpowering desire to remain together survive the devastating onslaught of slavery. On the, base of a let- on the basis of letters and documents such as birth records retrieved from plantations, retrieved from plantations listing fathers as well as mothers, Gutman demonstrates not only that slaves adhered to strict norms regulating their familiar uh, regulating their familial arrangements but that these norms differed from those governing from those governing the white family life around them marriage taboos naming practices and sexual mores which incidentally sanctioned premarital premarital intercourse set slaves apart from their masters as they tried desperately and daily to maintain their family lives enjoying as much autonomy as they see as they could seize slave men and women manifested a replaceable talent in humanizing and in humanizing an environment designed to convert them into a herd of subhuman labor units everyday choices made by slave men and women such as remaining with the same spouse. I'm sorry for the feedback. Let me see this one thing real quick. Everyday choices made by slave men and women, such as remaining with the same spouse for many years, naming or not naming the father of a child, taking as a wife and taking as a wife a woman who had child. Oh, I'm sorry. Taking as a wife a woman who had children by unnamed fathers. Giving a newborn child the name of a father, an aunt, or an uncle, or a grandparent. And dissolving an incompatible marriage. Contradicted in behavior, not in, not in rhetoric. The powerful ideology that viewed the slave as a perpetual child or a repressed savage. Their domestic arrangements and kin networks together with the enlarged communities that flowed from these primordial ties made it clear to their children and that the slaves were not men were non-men and non-women it is unfortunate that Gutman did not attempt to determine the actual position of women within the slave family in demonstrating the existence of a complex family life 
encompassing husbands and wives alike, got men eliminated when the main pillars on which the matriarchy argument has stood. However, he did not substantially cha- however, he did not substantially challenge the complementary claim that there were two parent that there were two parent families. The family dominated the man. Moreover, as Gutman's own research confirms, social life in the slave quarters was largely was largely an extension of family life. Thus, woman's role within the family must have defined to a great extent their social status within the slave community as a whole. More schol- most scholars' studies have interpreted the slave family life as elevating the woman and debasing the men, even when both mother and father were present. According to Stanley Elkins, for example, the mother's role loomed, lar- loomed far larger than the, for the slave child than did for the... the let's start this one over. I'm, I apologize. According to Stanley Elkins, for example, the mother's role loomed far larger for the ch- slave child than did that of the father. She, control- she controlled those few activities. Household care, preparation of food, and rearing of children that were left to the slave family. The systematic designation of slave men as as boys by the master was a reflection, according to Elkins, of their inability to execute their fatherly responsibilities. Kenneth Stamp pursues this line of reasoning even further than Elkins. The typical slave family was matriarchal in form, for the mother's role was far more important than the father's. Insofar as the family did have significance, it involved responsibilities which traditionally belonged to women, such as clean house, such as cleaning house, preparing food, making clothes, and raising children. The husband was at most his wife the husband was at most his wife's assistant her companion, and her sex partner. He was often thought of as her possession, as was the cabin in which they lived. It is true that domestic life took on an it is true that domestic life took on an exaggerated importance in the social life of slaves, for it did indeed provide them with the only space where they could truly experience themselves as human beings. Black women for this reason, black women for this reason, and also because they were workers just like men, were not debased by the domestic functions in the way that white women came to be. Unlike their white counterparts, they can never be treated as mere housewives, but to go further and maintain that they consequently dominated their men is so fundamentally distort the re- is to fundamentally distort the reality of slave life. In an essay I wrote in 1971, using the free, using the few resources allowed to me in my jail cell, I characterized the significance of the slave woman's domestic functions in the following way. In the infinite anguish of ministering to the needs of the men and children around her, she was performing the only labor of the slave community which could not be directed which could not be directly and immediately claimed by the oppressor there was no compensation for the work in the fields it served no purpose no useful purpose for the slaves domestic labor was the only meaningful labor was the only mean, meaningful labor for the slave community as a whole Precisely through performing the drudgery which has long been the central expression of the social of the social condition and purity of woman, the black woman in chains could help to lay the foundation for some degree of autonomy, both for herself and for her men. Even as, even as she was suffering under her unique oppression as females, she was thrust 
she was thrust into the center of the slave community. She was, therefore, essential to the survival of the community. I have since realized that the special character of domestic labor during slavery, its centrality to men and women in bondage, involved work that was not exclusively female. Slave men executed Slave men executed important domestic relationships and were not, therefore, as Kenneth Sam put it, the mere helpmates of their women. For while women cooked and sued, for example, men did the gardening and hunting, yams, corn, and other vegetables, as well as wild animals such as rabbits and possums, were always a delicious addition to the mon- to the mon- the monot- I'm sorry, the monotonous daily daily rations, rations rather. The sexual division of domestic labor does not appear to have been hierarchical. Men's tasks were certainly not superior to and were hardly inferior to the work performed by women. They were both equally necessary. Moreover, from all the indications, the, the division of labor between the sexes was not always so rigorous, for men would sometimes work in the cabin and women might tend the garden, and perhaps even join the hunt. The salient theme emerging from domestic life in the slave quarters is one of sexual, inequality, of sexual equality. The labor that slaves performed for their own sake, and not for the aggrandization of their masters, was carried out on terms of equality. Within the confines of their family, family and community life, therefore, black people com- Black people managed to accomplish a magnificent feat. They transformed that negative equality which emanated from the equal oppression they suffered as slaves into a positive equality. The egalitarianism characterizing their social relations. Although although Eugene Genovese's major argument in Roll Jordan Roll is at best problematic that black people accepted the paternalism associated with slavery. That's a nuts argument. He does present an insightful, though abbreviated, picture of the slave's home life. The story of the slave, wo- the story of the slave woman as wives requires indirect examination to deduce it from an assumption that the man was a great... I'm sorry... To deduce it from an assumption that the man was a guest in the house will not do. A review of the actual position of the men as husbands and fathers suggests that the position of the woman was much more complex than usually credited. The woman's, the woman's attitude toward housework, especially cooking, and toward their own femininity by itself belies the conventional wisdom according to which the woman unwittingly helped ruin their men by asserting themselves in the home, protecting their children and assuming other and assuming other normally masculine responsibilities. While there is a touch of male supremacy in his analysis, implying, as he does, that masculinity and femininity are immutable concepts, he clearly recognizes that what what has usually been viewed as a debilitating female supremacy was in fact a closer approximation to a healthy sexual equality than was possible for most white people and perhaps even for postbellum black people. What does that mean? The most fascinating point Genevieve raises here, although he doesn't develop it, is that women often defended their men from the slave system attempts to demean them. Most women, perhaps a substantial majority, he says, understood whenever their men were degraded. So too were they. Furthermore, they wanted their boys to grow up to be men and knew perfectly well that to do so, they needed the example of a strong black man in the front. Their boys needed strong male models to be the same exact. Their boys needed strong male models 
to be the same extent that their girls needed strong female models. If black women bore the terrible burden of equality and oppression, if they enjoyed equality with their men in their domestic environment, then they also asserted their equality aggressively in challenging the inhuman institution of slavery. They resisted the challenge, they resisted the sexual assaults of white men, defended their families, participated in work stoppages and revolts. As Herbert Apthiger as Herbert Apthiger points out in his pioneering work, American Slave Revolts, they positioned their masters. They was they I'm sorry, they poisoned their masters, committed other acts of sabotage, and like their men, joined joined communities and frequently fled northward to freedom. From the numerous accounts of the violent repression over from the numerous accounts of the violent oppression overseers inflicted on women, it must be inferred that she who passively access that she who passively accepted her lot as a slave was the exception rather than the rule. When Frederick Douglass reflected on his childhood, when Frederick Douglass reflected on his childhood introduction on his childhood introduction to the merciless violence of slavery, he recalled the floggings and torture of how many of many rebellious women. His cousin, for example, was horribly beaten as she unsuccessfully resisted an overseer's sexual attack. A woman called Aunt Esther, Esther, Esther was viciously flogged for defying her master, who insisted that she break off relations with a man she loved. One of Frederick Douglass' most vivid descriptions of the ruthless punishments reserved for slaves involving a young woman named Nellie, who was whipped for the offense of impotence. Wow. There were times when she seemed likely to get the better of the, of the brew, but he finally overpowered her and succeeded in getting her arms tied to the tree towards which he had been dragging her. The victim was now at the mercy of his merciless wrath. The cries of the now helpless woman, which are undergoing their terrible affliction, were, were mangled with the hoarse curses of the overseer and the wild cries of her distracted children. While the poor, when the poor woman was untied, her back was covered with blood. She was whipped, terribly whipped, but she was not subdued and continued to denounce the overseer and to pour upon him every vile epithet of which she could think of. Douglas adds that he doubts whether the overseer ever attempted to whip Nellie again. Like Harriet Tubman, numerous women fled slavery for the North. Many were successful, though many were captured. One of the most dramatic escapes one of the most dramatic escape attempts involved a young woman, possibly a teenager, named Anne Wood, who directed a wagon load of armed boys in Sorry. One of the most dramatic escape attempts involved a young woman, possibly a teenager, named Anne, w Anne Wood who directed a wagon load of armed boys and girls as they ran for their freedom. After setting out on Christmas Eve, 1855, they engaged in a shootout with slave catchers. Two of them were killed, but the rest, according to all indicators, made their way to the north. The, the abolitionist Sam, um, I'm sorry, the abolitionist Sarah Krimke Describe the case of a woman's, of a woman whose resistance was not so successful as Anne Woods. This woman's repeated efforts to escape from the domination, 
from the you know, domination over South Carolina Master under so many floggings that a finger could not be laid between the cuts. Because she seized, because she seized every available opportunity to break free from the plantation, she was eventually held prisoner in a, in a heavy iron collar. In a case she was managed to break the collar, a front tooth was pulled out as an identification mark. Although her, own, although her owners, said Grimke, were known as a charitable and Christian family, this suffering slave, who was a seamstress of the family, was continually in presence, sitting in the chamber to sue or engaging in other household work with her lacerated and bleeding back, her mutilated mouth and heavy iron collar, without so far as appeared exciting any feelings of a compassion. Woman resisted and advocated challenges to slavery at every turn. Given the unceasing repression of women, no wonder, Herbert Afterger says, the black woman so often urged to haste in slave pro- in slave polity. Virginia, 1812. She said that she said they could ra- not rise too soon for her, as she had been. I'm sorry. Let's start this over. Let's start over. She said they could not rise too soon for her, as she had rather be in hell than where she was. Mississippi, 1835. She wished to. She wished to God it was all over and done with. She was tired of waiting on white folks. One may better not understand now, a Margaret, Ga- a Margaret Garner, Garner, a Margaret Garner, fugitive slave, who then trapped her n- near sin- who I'm sorry. Uh, one may better earn, one may better understand now, a Margaret Garner, fugitive slave, who, when trapped near Cincinnati, killed her own daughter and tried to kill herself. She rejoiced that the girl was dead. Now she would never know what a woman suffers as a slave and pleaded to be tried for murder. I will go singing to the gallows rather than be returned to slavery. Communities composed of fugitive slaves and their descendants could be found throughout the South as early as 1642 and as late as 1864. These communities were havens for fugitives, served as served as bases for marauders. Uh, mara- 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 as marauding, mara- yeah, I think it's marauding expeditions against nearby plantations at a time and at times supplied leadership to planned uprisings. In 1816, a large and flourishing community was discovered. 300 escaped slaves, men, women, and children, had occupied a fort in Florida. When they refused to surrender themselves, the army launched a battle which lasted for 10 days and claimed the lives of more than 250 of the inhabitants. The woman fought back on equal terms with the men. During the course of another confrontation at Mobile, Mobile, I'm sorry, in Mobile, Alabama, in 1827, men and women alike were unrelenting, were unrelenting fighting, according to local newspapers, like Spartans. Resistance was often more subtle than revolt, then resistance was often more subtle than revolts, escapes, and sabotage. It involved, for example, the clandestine acquisition of reading and writing skills, and the imparting of this knowledge to others. In Nantes, Nantes, Louisiana, a slave woman ran a midnight school, teaching her people between the hours of 11 and 2 until she had graduated hundred, hundreds 
Undoubtedly, many of them wrote their own passes and headed in the direction of freedom. In Alex Haley's roots, his fictionalized narrative of his ancestors' lives, Kunta Kinte's wife, Belle, painfully taught herself to read and write. By secretly reading her master's newspapers, she stayed abreast of current political events and, commuted, and communicated this knowledge to her sister and brother slaves. No discussion of the part played by women in resisting slavery will be complete without paying tribute to Harriet Tubman for the extraordinary feats she, she performed as a conductor. No discussion of the part played by women in resisting slavery would be complete without paying tribute to Harriet Tubman for the, extra for the extraordinary feats she performed as a conductor for over 300 people on the Underground Railroad. Her early life unfolded in a manner typical of most slave women's lives. A field hand in Maryland, she learned through work that her, put that her potential as a woman was the same as any man's. Her father taught her to chop wood and split rails as they worked side by side. He gave her lessons which, which would later prove indispensable during the 19 trips she made back and forth to the south. He taught her how to walk soundlessly through the woods and how to find food and medicine among the plants, roots, and herbs herbs. The fact that she never once suffered defeat is no doubt attributable to her father's instructions. Throughout the Civil War, Harriet, Tubman's continu Harriet Tubman continued her relentless, her relentless opposition to slavery. And even today, she still holds the distinction of being the only woman in the United States to have ever led troops into battle. Whatever the standards used to judge her, black or white, male or female, Harriet Tubman was indeed an exceptional individual. But from another vantage point, what she did was simply to express in her own way the spirit of strength and perseverance which so many other women of her race had acquired. This bears repeating. This bears repeating. Black women were equal to their men in the oppression they suffered. They were, they were their men's social equals within the slave community. And they resisted slavery with a passion equal to the men's. This was one of the great ironies of the slave system. For in subjugating, I'm sorry, but for subjecting women to the most ruthless exploitation conceivable. Explanation, I'm sorry, exploitation which knew, which knew no sex distinctions. This is one of the greatest ironies of the slave system. For him subjecting women to the most ruthless exploitation conceivable. Exploitation which knew no sex distinctions the groundwork was able to be, was created not only for black women to assert the equality through their social relations but also to express it through their acts of resistance this must have been a terrifying terrifying revelation for the slave owners for it seems that they were trying to break this chain of equality through the especially brutal repression they reserved for the women Again, it is important to remember that the punishment inflicted on women exceeded in intensity the punishment exceeded in intensity the punishment suffered by their men. For women were not only whipped and mutilated, they were also raped. It would be a mistake to regard the institutionalized patterns of rape during slavery as an expression of white men's sexual urges otherwise stifled by the specter of white, woman's, of white womanhood chastity. 
That would be far too simplistic an explanation. Rape was a weapon of domination, a weapon of repression, with whose covert goal was to extinguish slave woman's will to resist, and in the process to demoralize their men. These observations on the role of rape during the Vietnam War can also be applied to slavery. In, Vi in Vietnam, the U.S. military command made rape socially acceptable. In fact, it was unwritten but clear policy. When GIs were encouraged to rape Vien Vietnamese women and girls, and they were sometimes advised to search women with their prim okay. And they were sometimes advised to search women with their penises. A weapon of mass political terrorism was forged. Since the Vietnamese women were distinguished by their heroic contributions to their poor to their people's liberation struggle, their military retaliation specifically suited them for rape. While women were hardly immune to the violence inflicted on men, they were especially singled out as victims of terrorism by a sexist military force governed by the principle that war was exclusively a man's affair. I saw one, one, I saw one case where a woman was shot by a sniper, one of our snipers, a GI said. When we got, when we got up to her, she was asking for water, and the lieutenant said to kill her. So we ripped off our clothes and stabbed her in both breasts. They then spread her. They then. They spread her eagle, and shoved an e tool, and trenching up her vagina. And then they took that out, and used a tree limb. And then she was shot. In the same way that rape was institutionalized, was an institutionalized ingredient of the aggression carried out against these Vietnamese people, de designed to intimidate and terrorize the women, slave owners encouraged the terroristic use of rape in order to put black women in their place. If black women had achieved a sense of their own strength and a strong urge to resist their violent sexual assaults, so the slaveholders might have reasoned, would remind the women of their essential and inalterable femaleness. In the male supremacy vision of this period, this meant passivity. This meant passivity, acquiescence, and weakness. Virtually, all the slave narrative of the 19th century contain accounts of the slave woman's sexual victimization at the hands of the master and overseers. Henry Bibbs, Henry Bibbs' master, forced one slave to be his son's concubine. M.F. Jameson's overseer raped a pretty slave girl in Solomon, in Solomon Northup, Zona. And Solomon Northup's owner once forced one slave, Patsy, to be his sexual partner. Despite the testimony of slaves about the high incident of rape and sexual coercion, the issue of sexual abuse has been all has been all but glossed over in the tradition in the traditional literature on slavery. It is sometimes even assumed that slave women welcomed and encouraged the sexual attentions of white men. What happens between them, therefore, was not sexual exploitation, but rather misintegration. The section of Roll Jordan Roll, devoted to interracial sex, Genevieve insists that the problem of rape pales in relation to the merciless taboos surrounding misintegration. Many white men, the author says, 
who began by taking a slave girl in the act of sexual exploitation ended up ended by loving her and the child she bore. The tragedy of misanagation lay as a consequence, not in its collapse into loss and sexual exploitation. Hello, how are you doing? Pretty, yep, doing all right. No, you're you're all right. You're all right. Yeah. I'm gonna sing you guys a song for protection, but I just don't want to be on camera. Oh uh, yeah, we're live right now. We're live on camera right now. Thank you. I appreciate the thought though. I'll let you I'll just no. sing over that way. All right. All right. Okay. Genevieve's overall approach hinges on the issue of paternalism. Slaves, he argues, more or less accepted the paternalistic posture of their masters, and masters were compelled by their paternalism to acknowledge slave claims of humanity. But since, in the eyes of the masters, the slave's humanity was childlike at best, it is not surprising that Genevieve's Genevieve it's not surprising that Genovese believes he has discovered a kernel of that humanity and misintegration. He fails to understand that there good morning. He fails to understand that there could hardly be a basis for delight, affection, and love as long as white men as long as white men, by virtue of their economic position, have unlimited access to black women's bodies. It was, an oppre- it, was, it was as oppressors, or in case of non-slave owners, as agents of domination, that white men approached black women's bodies. Genovese would do well to read Gail Jones, uh, uh, Cor- Corridora, C O C O R R E G I D O R O R A C O R E E G I D O R A, a recent novel by a young black woman, which chronicles the attempts of sexual of sexual. Uh, I'm sorry, which chronicles the attempts of several generations of women. To preserve the evidence of the sexual crimes committed during slavery. E. Franklin Fraser thought he had discovered in misintegration black people's most important cultural achievement during slavery. The master in his mansion and his colorful and his colored oh shit. The master in his mansion and his black mistress in her special house. Near, in a special house nearby represented the final triumph of social ritual and the presence of the deepest feelings of human solidarity. At the same time, however, he could not entirely dismiss the numerous women who did not submit without a fight. The physical compulsions was, were necessary at times to secure submission on the part of black women is supported by historical evidence that had preserved in the tradition of black families. He cites the story of a woman whose great grandmother always described with he cites the story of a woman whose great grandmother always described with the uh, enthusiasm. We're getting prayed. Oh, no. uh, we're getting sung. We're, I don't know. Somebody is singing for our safety. Uh, I believe. I believe you said they're praying for our safety. It would show you, but they said they didn't want to be on camera. So. Okay. What the hell was that? 
Okay. Um, my fault. Sorry, my fault. Okay. Wait, so this paragraph over. He cites the story of a woman whose great grandmother always described with enthusiasm the battles which she had earned, the considerable scars on her body. But there was one scar she was persistent, persistently refused to explain, saying whenever she was asked about it, White men are as low as dogs. White men are as low as dogs, child. Stay away from them. White men are as low as dogs, child. Stay away from them. After her death, the mystery was finally solved. She received that scar at the hands of her master's youngest son, a boy of about 18 years at the time. She conceived their child, my grandmother, Ellen. White women who joined the abolitionist movement were especially outraged by the sexual assaults of black women. Activists in the female anti-slavery society often related stories of brutal rapes of slave women as they appealed to white women to defend their black sisters. While these women made ina inestimable contributions to the anti-slavery campaign, they often failed to grasp the complexity of the slave, of the slave woman's condition. Black women were women indeed, but their experience during slavery, but their experiences during slavery, hard work with their men, e equality within the family, resistance, floggings, and rape, had encouraged them to develop. Did they just leave? At the end of the prayer. Thank you. One of the most, no, no, had encouraged them to develop certain personality traits which sets them apart from most white women. One of the most popular pieces of abolitionist literature was Harriet Beecher's, so, was Harriet Beecher's Lowe's, um, UT Cabin, UT Cabin. A book which rallied vast numbers of people and more women than ever before the anti-slavery cause. Abraham Lincoln once casually ref uh, referred to Stowe as the woman who started the Civil War. Yet the enormous influence yet the enormous in influence of her book enjoyed I'm sorry, let's start that over. Yet the enormous influence her book enjoyed cannot compensate for his utter distortion of slave life. The central figure is a the central figure is a travesty of a black woman, a, a naive, hmm, a naive transposition of the mother figure, praised by the cultural propaganda of the period from white society to the slave community. Eliza is white womanhood incarnate, but in blackface, or rather because she is a, uh, she is, uh, what, um, I don't, yeah, that's a question, of, no, that's a gray area, because she is a, uh, a person who is, uh, mixed, mm, a person who is, uh, <laughs> uh, in just a little less than the white face. It may have seen, it may have been Stowe's hope that white woman readers of her novel would discover themselves in Eliza. They could admire her superior, her superior, I'm sorry, they could admire her superior Christian morality, her unfaltering maternal instincts, her gentleness and fragility, for those were the very qualities white women were being taught to cultivate in themselves. Just as Eliza's whiteness allows her to become the epitome of motherhood her husband George, whose ancestry is predominantly white, comes closer than any other black man in the book to being a man in the orthodox male supremacist sense. Unlike the domestic acquiescence, 
Childlike UT UT George is ambitious Intelligent Literate And most important of all He detests slavery With an unquenchable passion When George decides Very early in the book To flee to Canada Eliza the pure Sheltered house servant Is terribly frightened By his overflowing Hatred of slavery Eliza trembled and Eliza trembled and was silent. She had never seen her husband in this mood before, and her gentle system of ethics seemed to bend like a reed in the surges of such passions. Eliza is practically oblivious to the general injustice of slavery. Her, fen- her feminine submissiveness has prompted her to surrender herself to her fate as a slave and to the will of her good, kind master and mistress. It is only when her maternal status is threatened that she finds the strength to stand up and fight. Like the mother who discovers she can lift an automobile if her child is trapped underneath. Eliza experiences a surge of maternal power when she learns that her son is going to be sold. Her kind master's financial troubles compel him to sell UT and Eliza's son, Harry, despite, of course, the compassionate and maternal pleas of his wife. Eliza grabs Harry and instinctively runs away, for stronger than... For stronger than all was maternal love route into a paroxysm of frenzy by the nearest by the near approaches of a fearful danger. Eliza's mother courage is spellbinding when, when, and of course, in the course of her flight, she reaches an impassable river of melting ice. The slave catcher hot on her heels, she spirits Harry across. She she threw him? She spirits Harry across. Nerve with strength such as God only gives and in the desperate she vaulted sheer sheer over the turbid uh, she, sh- she vaulted sheer over the turbid current by the shore and on the raft of ice beyond with wi- with wild cries and desperate energy she leaped to another and sand still another s- hmm with wild cries and desperate energy, she leaped to another, and still another cake. Stumbling, leaping, slipping, springing upwards again. Her shoes are gone, her stockings cut from her feet, while blood marked every step. But she saw nothing, felt nothing. Till so dimly as in a dream, she saw the Ohio side, and a man helping her up in the bank. The implausibility of Eliza's melodramatic feat matters little to Stowe because God imparts superhuman abilities to gentle Christian mothers. The point, however, is that because she accepted wholesale 19th century mothership worship, Stowe miserably fails to capture the reality and the truth of black woman's resistance to slavery. Countless acts of heroism carried out by the slave mothers have been documented. These women, unlike Eliza, were driven to defend their children by their passionate abhorrence, abhorrence of slavery. The sources, the source of their strength was not some mystical power attached to motherhood, but rather their concrete experience as slaves. Some, like Margaret Garner, went so far as to kill their children rather than witness their growth in adulthood. Under the, uh, some like Mar- Mark Garner went so far as to kill their children rather than witness the growth of adulthood under the brutal circumstances of slavery. Eliza, on the other hand, is quite unconcerned about the overall inhumanity of the slave system. Had she not been threatened with the sale of her son, she would have pro- she would have probably lived happily ever after under the conditions of benefit 
under the benefits hmm. and the beneficent tutelage of her master and mistress the Elizas if they indeed existed were certainly oddities among the great majority of black women they did not in any event represent the acclimated experience of all those women who toiled who toiled under the lash for their master worked for and protected their families fought against slavery and who were beaten and raped but never subdued it was those women who passed on to their mo- to their normal it was those women who passed on their normally free female descendants a legacy of hard work perseverance and self-reliance a legacy of tenacity resistance and insistence on fem- on uh, sexual equality in short a legacy spelling out standards for a new womanhood so that uh, that marks the end of chapter one got it. it's been a crazy morning been a crazy what we're gonna do I don't think it's supposed to rain not until I believe the evening so I think we're gonna move the set we're gonna end this live we're gonna move the set